How about, how about now? Yes, there, there it is. All right. It pressed in the wrong direction. But let, let me go ahead and, and get started. So this is, this is a quote for, from Kate... This is a quote from Kate Moss that says, nothing tastes as good as skinny feels. And I'm going to try the best we can to explain why that actually may be true for people with anorexia nervosa. So uh, you, you may be interested in this recent editorial in the European Eating Disorder Review uh, by uh, Schmidt and Campbell that you know, raised the question about uh, treatment of eating disorders cannot remain brainless. And uh, I'm going to talk about that today, how we can really use neurobiology to really kind of inform us about what's going on in the brain of people with eating disorders and how, more importantly, we can actually use that in developing treatments. So in this limited time, I'm going to spend a little bit of time just kind of talking about brain and behavior, give you kind of an overview, uh, talk about the biology of reward and risk, and then talk about what we're doing in terms of developing tem temperament-based treatments. So just before I get started, I just want to thank uh, many of the collaborators I work with at San Diego and Pittsburgh in developing the, uh, the data uh, that I'm going to show you today. Um, so the question in anorexia is really very straightforward. Uh, let me talk about obesity first. Now, th this is a study that looked at various uh, treatments of obesity, behavioral treatment, dieting, or the combination, and found that, as we see in obesity, people do lose weight in the short term. But in the long term, if you look over five years, the recidivism rate is very high in obesity. And clearly, you know, people in general have a hard time dieting. And one thing that's very different about anorexia is that this is a group of people that can literally starve themselves to death. Now, I challenge anybody in this room that's never had an eating disorder to eat 500 calories a day for the next 10 years. You literally can't do it. There's going to be homeostatic systems that are going to kick in your body, and they're going to be so powerful that you cannot resist. You know, it's like an obesity. It's very hard to resist that drive to eat. So what's different about the biology of people with anorexia nervosa? So, and, and one of the reasons that we've had a hard time understanding this is, is because of this, the fact that these are really kind of puzzling kind of symptoms. Uh, and for those of you who don't do this every day, this is a disorder, of course, that occurs mostly in adolescents, uh, in, in females. Um, it, uh, not only is there severely restricted eating and, and emaciation, but these are people that have uh, body image distortions and a fear of becoming fat, although not everybody has exactly those symptoms. Uh, despite dieting, they uh, tend to be preoccupied with food, cook for others, collect calorie uh, recipes. Uh, and the thing that really makes it so hard to treat is that we're not on the same team. As opposed to most people with psychiatric disorders that come in and say, I feel lousy, help me feel better. This is a group of people that don't see themselves as having a problem and a resistance to treatment and makes it so hard to engage them. And, and also, we really don't have any proven treatments that reverse core eating disorder symptoms, uh, particularly in anorexia nervosa. And, and um, the good news is that over the course of time, and it can be five to 10 years, 50% uh, or more will recover, but there's still a substantial number that remain either chronically ill or, as Scott's data is so elegantly shown, uh, there's a substantial portion that die. So these are disorders where people tend to, the, the common notion is these are psychosocially derived disorders. And clearly, body image and, you know, diet is important to all of us. And it's, you know, there's a lot of public, you know, a lot of, um, you know, you know people in us and everything like that publish a lot about celebrities, blah, 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 and things like that. Eating disorders, however, predate this current culture. This is a description of somebody uh, from more than 300 years ago in England that most likely had anorexia nervosa. I won't bother reading it, but it's a, it's a pretty well, really well-known quote. Um, so many women died in this culture, but you know, relatively few people develop anorexia and bulimia. You know, a few percent. Do you think that it's just if this is just culture that the rates of anorexia and bulimia would be much higher? And so the question is, are there some susceptibility factors that make people vulnerable to dieting and weight loss? And in fact, uh, just a very brief review of the literature, um, these are studies, first of all, one of the things that we've learned that eating disorders run in families. If you have anorexia or bulimia, you have a much higher chance of having a relative who's had an eating disorder. 
Uh, and of course, this doesn't really tell you whether it's learned or, 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 or genes, but twin studies over and over again have shown that somewhere between 50 to 80 percent of the contributing factors are genetic, are not, uh, are, are, not, are not culture. So genes are really more powerful in culture in terms of a vulnerability to develop an eating disorder. And what do genes do? Well, you know, that, of course, we don't really understand. But, you know, the likelihood is that genes contribute to some, some temperament and personality very, uh, risk factors that, that create a susceptibility to develop an eating disorder. And some of those things are anxiety, harm avoidance, perfectionism, inhibition, compliance, obsessive personality, drive for achievement. These are all traits that tend to exist in people at risk for eating disorders pre-morbidly. Years before they ever develop an eating disorder, these are, these are personality and, and temperament traits that these kids tend to have. And if you don't believe me, just ask your patients with anorexia and bulimia and their parents what they were like as children years before they ever developed an eating disorder. So this contributes to a powerful neurobiology, but what is that? So just to kind of give you some, some uh, idea of kind of how this might uh, develop, so the people have this, this temperament. And I would say, you know, in the literature, although not uh, large, uh, suggests that most people who uh, go on to develop an eating disorder as children tend to be anxious, uh, sometimes have depression, they almost always are perfectionistic. Many of them have an obsessive kind of personality, but they're good little kids. They're compliant. They do well in school. They're not, they're not really a problem. And then something happens during adolescence, and we don't understand that, whether it's it's, it's gonadal steroids related to puberty or brain development or stress or cultural factors, or most likely with human behavior, there's some combination of all those. Uh, that ends up developing an eating disorder. And then people start to diet. Uh, they develop weight loss, particularly for anorexia nervosa. And then there's a whole series of cascades and, and, and secondary consequences to losing weight. And people often kind of cycle out of control. And the more weight they lose, the more weight they want to lose, and they literally can starve themselves to death. Now, one of the things that's been noted over and over in the literature is that these are anxious kids. And there's something about, they'll often tell you there's something about eating food that makes them anxious, and there's something about not eating food that makes them feel better. And is that true? And how could we understand the biology of that? Well, I think we, we're starting to have some clues now. And the thing I think that's really important, the reason that we're focusing on these temperament traits is if you're going to ask the question about what's the etiology of anorexia nervosa, I think one of the places that you want to consider starting is with this temperament and personality. If, in fact, these are risk factors and they're almost always there uh, creating a vulnerability, that may be actually a real important clue as to what you ought to look at in terms of brain systems uh, to understand why people act this way and what that vulnerability is. So that's kind of been the focus of our, of our research because, as it turns out, not only are these traits there pre-morbidly, uh, they persist in, after recovery, even in people who, do, who recover and do very well in life. So, you know, another one of the problems that we have is our understanding of psychiatric disorders are, you know, basically these are syndromes. Um, that, uh, you know, they're clusters of symptoms that we've kind of maybe arbitrarily, maybe not put together in trying to understand behavior. There are no brain centers for, that you can knock out that create anorexia or temperament. And we need some new understanding of how behavior is encoded in brain and some new vocabulary and way of describing these kind of behaviors. And this is really difficult because I think it, pre it presents a challenge to everybody in the field that in some ways everything we've learned about behavior is becoming obsolete and we begin to have to begin to understand now a new language of understanding how the brain works and how we're going to describe behavior. And then the question is how these circuits function in eating disorders. So just to give you an analogy, if, if you went into your doctor 100 years ago, and I'm afraid psychiatry is where medicine was about 100 years ago, and you were coughing up something, you know, they, the doctor would look at you and say, well, what color is that? Is it, is it red? Is it white? Is it yellow? You know, and you know, we know that the color of sputum now is just a consequence of kind of different kind of elements that may be in it, like blood or white blood cells. But they might try and diagnose you on the basis of the color of that sputum and give you some 
some kind of treatment which probably didn't work uh, and it wasn't related to the etiology. You know, what medicine has been able to do now, it's been able to understand the etiology of, of the cause of things like lung infections. And now we know, you know, if you have, you're coughing something up, we can tell whether it's bacterial or a virus or TB or a tumor. And the treatments for those are very specific. And that's where we, gotta, we have to get to in psychiatry, is really being able to parse the brain in such a way that we've got to understand how things are encoded and treat things very specifically. So one of the questions that we wanted to ask is, you know, these are called appetite disorder, uh, eating disorders. Uh, is there actually a disturbance of appetite? And if we're going to ask that kind of question, where would you look? And uh, of course, the problem with appetite regulation is it's very complicated. That there are multiple systems that interact to actually uh, arrive at a signal uh, how hungry you are and how much food that you ought to eat. That there are, there are systems in the periphery, in the gut, uh, you know, adipose tissue, uh, 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 you know, nervous, uh, autonomic nervous system, uh, hormones that get released, blah, 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 that really uh, it, uh, create signals that go to, into the brain, particularly into the hypothalamus, that tell you something about uh, energy balance. And those are critically important. Well, what we've learned and, what, and what's really important about brain imaging is this has finally given us a tool in the last decade or so to be able to interrogate the brain in living people and ask questions about circuits that are involved in appetite regulation. We've never really had this capacity before. And, and by doing that in animal and human studies, we've actually learned a lot about top-down regulation of appetite control. So one of the things that we've learned is that there are systems in the brain, particularly in the uh, nucleus accumbens and limbic system that are very important uh, for telling us about the pleasure and the motivation, the reward of food. And there are other centers, other higher cortical centers that are very important for, in terms of self-control and inhibition that, that may be able to inhibit those kind of uh, response to those kind of, uh, those kind of messages. And you know, one of the possibilities is that people with anorexia, there are disturbances of these systems. So how do, what's the take-home message that how can we understand this in terms of everyday life? Well, there's, there's mounting evidence now that these systems are, are contribute to obesity and the obese overeat despite having sufficient energy stores. So just because they're getting peripheral messages about having too much energy, they still overeat. And you can raise questions about people with anorexia. Why do they undereat even though they, get, they must be getting messages about being emaciated? Now, you know, for all of us, food becomes more pleasurable if you're, if you're hungry. If, if you go without eating for a day or two, people tend to get kind of irritable and, and, and feel uncomfortable. And there's something about that taste, first taste of food that's much more pleasurable. And food may be pleasurable after that. But the brain has ways to make food more rewarding. And I'll show you some of the data on that so that you know, this makes sense. If you're an animal out in the wild, you know, you're going to be motivated to go out and, and seek a meal, even though it may be a very very dangerous kind of environment. And, and we also uh, become satiated to food. So, you know, people you know, typically kind of eat at dinner. They may eat one sort of food. You get kind of tired of it, and then you move on to another food. You get kind of tired of it. You move on to the, another kind of food. That's, that's kind of a form of habituation. Food can be even aversive. And these are all kind of these top-down kind of messages. If you eat a small piece of chocolate cake for de dessert, that may taste great. If somebody forces you to eat that whole chocolate cake, it'll soon, soon turn into disgust. So the brain has ways of kind of coding the emotionality of food. So one of the areas that we wanted to look at was the insula. And, um, and the reason that we wanted to look at the insula was the insula is, and these connected reasons play a very important role in what we call interceptive awareness, which is self-awareness of, of our internal body states. And so not only is this um, hunger and satiety, but this is all, all kinds of messages about temperature, touch, um, you know, uh, uh, visceral and muscle uh, sensations, uh, as well as hunger and satiety. And the primary taste cortex, so if you taste something, for example, sweet, that primary taste cortex is part of the insula, but it's just part of many different kinds of self-awareness of body states.
And what the insula does very simplistically is it, you know, as you get more hungry or as you respond to some pain going on in your body, it will signal to you that there's something going on, some change that's occurred inside your insula, and maybe you ought to do something about that. You ought to be aware of it and do something about it. And it also is a very important part of the brain that kind of links into the cognitive and emotional processes and tells you something about motivating these current body states. Um, so what we did is we, these are a series of fMRI studies I'm going to tell you about. And without going into a lot of detail, you're probably well aware that fMRI studies tell you something about regions of the brain that become activated when you activate them with some kind of specific kind of task, uh, such as uh, taste, uh, taste of sugar. And, uh, you, you know, as we were talking this morning with, with Kevin, uh, the, one of the things that's very important, I think, about these first generations of studies is that, you know, it's not going to be a a resolution where we're going to understand the molecular biology of these systems, but we're at least going to be under, <clears throat> able to start to understand circuits and pathways that contribute to these puzzling kind of symptoms in people with eating disorders. So one of the first studies that we did is uh, we did a sweet taste uh, probe where we gave people repeated boluses of 10% uh, sugar. And um, uh, what we did is we did uh, a repeated uh, blocks of uh, stimuli. These were pseudorandom. They didn't know whether they were getting either, depending on the study, either water or an artificial kind of sweetener. And we, and let's see, I'm hoping that I didn't lose a slide here. Let's see. Ah, here we go. Okay. So the reason that we did this is that the pathway for responding to a sweet taste is actually very well described. From animal and other human studies, we understand that. So instead of this being kind of just kind of, gee, we could do a region of interest analysis, and we had a pretty good idea about what we were going to look at. And we could compare people with anorexia to people who didn't have anorexia. So just to walk you through this, when you taste something sweet, there are receptors in your tongue that actually that sweet that sugar molecule fits into, and it sends a signal up through your spinal cord and up through your brain stem and your thalamus into the, the insula, uh, into this primary taste cortex that basically just says, I've tasted something sweet. And the insula interacts with these emotionally and uh, motivational regulatory kind of uh, brain regions, uh, which are the, uh, the amygdala, to tell you something about uh, emotional relevance, uh, the orbital frontal cortex, that tells you something about uh, the incentive uh, salience of that, and the uh, um, uh, anterior cingulate cortex, which tells you something about you know, conflict more, um, or, uh, monitoring. And then this pathway actually feeds into the striatum, particularly the ventral aspect of the striatum, which is very important for kind of reward and initiation. And the reason I kind of, and so that when we do a study like this, we actually ask questions about what happens with these kinds of pathways. And there's also other pathways that are very important, which are the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex and, and the parietal cortex, which are part of, uh, let's see, get this to work here. So the, the pathways here um, that I've just talked about are part of the limbic system and these other part, and this is very important for kind of immediate kind of emotional relevance and the other pathways I'm identifying here are part of the executive or cognitive system which are more important for kind of long-term kind of cognitive and inhibitory kind of response. And I'm going to kind of come back to that and why that's, that's important. But the, the, so responding to a sweet taste just really kind of activates parts of the brain that are very important for kind of responding to any kind of salient stimuli. And the other thing that we did here is we looked at people after they recovered from anorexia. And the reason that we did that is that if, you know, when you're really emaciated and underweight, we're, we'd expect to all kind, find all kinds of abnormalities just because people are, are starved. And so, we want to, and so we want to ask the question about, does this persist after recovery? So we looked at, pe we looked at people who had, recovered from, who had recovered from anorexia nervosa and compared to controls. These are people in their 20s, normal body weight. And just as I mentioned before, even though people recover from anorexia, they tend to have certain temperament and personality traits, such as high harm avoidance, which is a measure kind of a combination of anxiety and inhibition and inflexibility.
So that remains, that remains uh, abnormally high. Uh, and these are people who, had, as far as by our definition, had recovered. They were normal weight, normal nutrition, immensities, and uh, not on medication. And there's been a number of studies that have suggested as you become uh, hungry, as you're starved, that there's increased activity the insula as well as the orbital frontal cortex. That's a response to this. That's part of uh, uh, this kind of uh, reflecting this gross message that I'm getting hungry, do something about it. So what we found in people with anorexia nervosa after recovery is that as compared to the, as compared to the controls here, um, the people with anorexia had a very diminished insula response as well as diminished response in, in the striatum in both actually uh, limbic and, and more cognitive kinds of reasons. And it's really pretty flat. And not only that, we saw exactly the same thing in a study that we had done earlier um, in another center with other patients uh, with another scanner. We found exactly the same thing, suggesting that there's, you know, this is a very strong finding that can be replicated. Now, what does that mean? Well, there's different ways of interpreting that. Uh, the, you know, the insula is very important in recognizing sweet taste. It's the primary gustatory cortex. Um, we don't think that people with anorexia, as far as we can tell, have, have disturbances of, of recognizing sweet taste. But the question is, is this a alteration in value rate and reward or failure to, to sense hunger? You know, I don't think that we really know that. Um, but it, it, you know, it's probably somewhere in between that, as well as they had decreased uh, response to the striatum, suggesting maybe there's a decreased motivation to approach food. Uh, so this actually you know, is very interesting and starts to shed light on why people with anorexia, probably exclusive of almost any other human being, can starve themselves to death. And maybe they're just not getting hungry the way you or I would get hungry if we, didn't, if we went without eating for a couple of years. So let me go on and kind of talk about this more generalized and trying to understand what the brain does and, and other studies that we're doing. Now, you know, the brain is really the organ that actually interacts with the environment. It, it helps us understand what's going on in the external world, what's going on in the internal world, like being hungry, and actually coming up with strategies uh, to meet our needs and to, to keep us alive. And so, you know, to do that, we need to identify the rewarding and the aversive significance of stimuli outside there in the world and generate a response. Do we like that, not like that? Is this good for us? Is this harmful? We have to weigh that, also the, sh the short and the long-term pros and cons of any kind of response. We might want to respond immediately, but realize on the long term, you know, that might be a dumb thing to do. Uh, so we have to be able to inhibit response or carry out motor activity to accomplish uh, some specific goal. And we have to learn from that. Um, and that uh, we have to develop strategies and anticipating the next time we see those signals, you know, what have we learned? Can we do this in a more efficient kind of appropriate kind of way? And, you know, if you're an animal, uh, you, you know, if you, the more appropriately and accurately you respond, you know, probably the better chance that you're going to stay alive. If you're kind of a schizophrenic animal, you're probably going to get eaten. You know, you're just not doing things very appropriately. Uh, you're probably not going to sense danger or something like that, and you're going to be out of the gene pool. So, and it really uses the same kind of pathways I've just talked about in terms of limbic and, and higher and, and executive kind of function. And just to kind of spell this out in kind of a, a schema for you, uh, the limbic system here, uh, these are cortical striatal loops that are very important for processing these kind of strategies. Uh, uh, the limbic, there's, uh, there's, been thought, there's thought to be three or more, depending on kind of what definition you're going to use, of limbic striatal loops. And very simply, what they do is the limbic system is very important for kind of understanding the emotional significance of stimuli, uh, kind of here and now. Um, and the cognitive or associative or executive, you know, one of the complications is we name the same system many different kinds of ways, um, is more important for a kind of effortful regulation of these effective states, kind of what might happen next, and plans and consequences and inhibiting behavior. And then you kind of put those two together and you carry out some kind of motor activity here, and you either approach and you avoid those kind of stimuli. 
So these are loops that kind of dip down between the striatum and, and the thalamus and up to the cortex. And you can think very simplistically that the cortex is kind of more of the CEO. It's kind of integrates all this very different kind of information, kind of oversees the big picture and tries to make decisions. And while the stratum is kind of more of the secretary, it kind of carries out, it makes the selection. You kind of say, do this, and the stratum kind of figures out to, you know, select this this approach and inhibit the other kind of competing kind of approaches. And, and um, the dopamine system is very important. Uh, reward signal is probably kind of really oversimplistic. The dopamine system probably is very important for kind of learning and kind of initiating and maybe even suppressing uh, various kinds of, of choices in the, in the, uh, in the striatum. Um, so to, let's go back to a simpler kind of model because that's really kind of a lot to understand. So you can break this down to kind of very simplistically. It's kind of in some ways a balance between reward and inhibition, you know, uh, immediate gratification and long-term kind of consequences. So if we kind of go back to this kind of model, this is a model that we're beginning to understand is very important not only for saline stimuli such as food, but also addiction and how people make decisions, economic decisions about money. It's the same system just used many different kinds of ways. And, you know, people have different ways of kind of different temperaments, and they have different biases with this system. So, for example, if you're in Las Vegas and you're playing blackjack, uh, you know, you, the dealer might have a 10, you have a 9 and a 19, you have to decide whether you're going to pick another card or not. And what are you going to do? You're going to use these parts of the brain. You're going to assess risk versus reward, your cards, the dealer's cards, how much in the pot, how much you can afford to lose, and you're going to make some kind of motor decision, better fold. Now, people have different temperaments for doing this. You know, there's a group of people that are going to over-respond to rewards or maybe underestimate risk, and they're going to increase the odds of losing, perhaps. And there's a group of people that are going to overestimate risk, reduce, and they're going to they're not going to lose as much, but they're going to decrease the odds of winning. And, you know, most of us kind of probably fall into one group or another. Some people like to gamble, some people don't. If you have an extreme of this, you probably end up with pathologic gambling uh, and, uh, and losing a lot of money. But this is, a, this is probably a lifelong temperament. It kind of gets wired into our brains in different kinds of ways. Now, what's different about people with anorexia? Well, you know, the things that appeal to most teenagers, uh, food, drugs, sex, and rock and roll, are not things that really appeal to adolescents with anorexia. This is a group of people that really have, uh, immediate gratification really isn't very important. This is a group of people that really worries about consequences uh, and, and can inhibit their behavior and are very concerned about, about self-control. And actually, there's a fair amount of data out there, and I'll just give you some examples of supporting this. It's been well known that people with anorexia, especially when they're malnourished, are pretty anhedonic. There's nothing more important to them, like Kate Moss says in a way, than, than starvation, uh, uh, not eating. And they're, they're actually insensitive to reward. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. And then the other side of this, um, this is a group of people. There's a, there's, a, there's a task that you can use called delayed discounting that actually asks people to choose between a smaller immediate reward and a larger delayed reward. Most people want it now, even if it's less. People with anorexia are one of the few, maybe the only population group that actually prefers you know, larger rewards later. Um, they're harm avoidant, they're sensitive to punishment, and um, let's see, I think there was, so that, yeah. So let me tell you, let me just summarize some of the imaging results we and others have found that actually kind of support that there's this imbalance. Uh, if you look in, in the limbic system, the anterior ventral striatum, which is the area of the nucleus accumbens, and very important for kind of reward, uh, we and others have found that there are abnormalities in dopamine metabolism in people with, with anorexia, and particularly in that part of the brain. And actually, if you do tasks that where you ask people with anorexia to distinguish between winning and losing, where in controls, you see controls respond in that part of the brain much more strongly to reward to winning than to losing. People with anorexia actually respond pretty much the same to winning and losing. It's like they can't tell the difference in terms of emotional immediate, immediate response in terms of immediate kind of uh, in, in part of the limbic system. In terms of 
the, this other area of the brain, uh, the executive or, or cognitive or associate system that worries about plans and consequences, several studies have shown that these are people that over-respond to making choices. And uh, we have found over and over again that the more anxious or harm of winds they are, the more activity they have in the circuit and respond to uh, things like responding to, uh, to uh, monetary choices. And uh, I'm going to show you a little data suggesting that they have increased sensitivity to punishment uh, and to loss in this part of the brain. So the bottom line is that there's evidence suggesting, in fact, neurologically, that there may be, in, you know, some some disturbance of of uh, some alteration in terms of kind of uh, immediate gratification and kind of worrying about long-term kind of consequences. So. Uh, now, interestingly enough, there's animal studies, not a great deal of literature, but there's animal studies that actually suggest that if you're a risk-avoidant rat, you have overactivity of, of, of this dorsal caudate part of the brain, the part of the brain that worries about consequences, and that if you're a human being that actually has a reduced inhibition, you have diminished activity, diminished dopamine kind of uh, uh, responsivity in that part of the brain that's very important for kind of uh, inhibition or, or not inhibiting kind of behavior. So there's some animal literature that actually supports that this might be true. So one of the studies we did was a monetary choice task where we asked people with anorexia to actually uh, just lay in the scanner and we showed them a, 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 a number and then uh, we, we, um, actually we, yeah, yeah, we showed them a question mark and then we asked them to make a guess about the number they saw, whether it was going to be uh, more or less than... Uh, five or eight. Anyway, if they guessed correctly, they won $2. If they guessed incorrectly, they lost a dollar. If they didn't guess, they lost, uh, they lost 50 cents. And um, it, this was kind of predetermined. Everybody got the same kind of, uh, you know, the same task, but the, the end, nobody knew that, of course. And people actually ended up winning about $40. Uh, about, uh, $40. And in this, this study particularly, we looked at people who were ill and underweight with anorexia nervosa. And the remarkable finding about it that we found is that if you look at the controls, just as I mentioned before, in, in, and this is in this executive cognitive reason, people with controls respond much more strongly to winning than to losing uh, money. And the thing that we found that was abnormal about people with anorexia is they actually respond uh, more strongly to, to punishment, to losing, than they did to winning. Uh, suggesting that they're over, this goes along with the clinical kind of uh, data suggesting this is a group of people that's very uh, oversensitive to punishment. Now, clinically, the way that people with anorexia often feel like they've done things wrong, they're making mistakes. Whatever they do isn't right, it isn't perfect enough, you know, and that they're very sensitive to criticism uh, or and they have poor self esteem. And part of this may be that they have this oversensitivity to feeling that they kind of make mistakes all the time. That whatever they do just doesn't feel like it's right. Like it's like an error, and this may be actually the uh, neurobiologic kind of uh, you know uh, reflection, uh, uh, you know substrate kind of underlying this kinds of, of behavior. The other thing that we found, and we've been able to replicate over and over again, at least in four or five different studies now, is in this part of the brain, in terms of the dorsal caudate, and it's very important with consequences, the more anxious with people with anorexia are, the more they respond in that part of the brain. And this goes along with actually being very sensitive to punishment. And whether it's the anxiety driving, you know, the sensitivity to punishment or the punishment making them very anxious, I, or, or you just, that isn't really the right way to think about it, in terms of how behaviors encoded the brain, I don't know, but this actually, you know, again, suggests that we're beginning to understand why people with anorexia are, are very anxious and where that lies. Now, how does this relate to, um, to eating and emotion? Well, as I mentioned before, for most of us, eating is rewarding and not eating feels bad, but for people with anorexia, there's something about eating that makes them very anxious. So we, we did a study that was kind of a proof of, of, of concept here, and that is that we gave people with anorexia a one-time dose of, a large dose of amphetamine. Now, the reason that we did that, amphetamine releases a lot of dopamine. And we really wanted to ask a question about what happens in these parts of the brain to people with anorexia. So we know that... Uh, F, and we did the uh, PET imaging kind of studies. I won't go into the details, but just to tell you, we were able to measure just how much endogenous dopamine was released. 
We've known for a long time that if you're a healthy control, most of the time people, you give people a large dose of amphetamine, they feel euphoric. And there's a substantial amount of data that suggests that in the, in the limbic system here, uh, where the, the codes rewards and emotion, that you see a very nice correlation. The more dopamine that's released, the more euphoric people get uh, that are healthy controls. And that's what we saw also. However, that's not what we saw with anorexia. What we saw is that we didn't see this relationship in this part of the brain. What we saw was we saw a correlation in, in the dorsal caudate, this part of the brain that's important for plans and consequences. The more dopamine released, the more anxious they were. Um, now that's very interesting because you release a little bit of dopamine as you eat food or you anticipate food and that's part of the signaling that tells you something about the rewarding aspects of food and very simplistically if you there's something very different about your wiring and when you're eating um, if you get a, if you get an anxious kind of message because dopamine is released you know it's going to make a lot of sense for you not to eat and, and so, you know, anxiety is wired in the brain in such a way that it's a very unpleasant, self-protective kind of mechanism. You get to a certain level of anxiety, you can't really ignore that. And if you find, if you, if you learn over time that by not eating, it's the only thing you really do to kind of diminish kind of that anxious kind of signal, it really kind of makes a lot of sense. Um, and actually, we're reusing a fair amount of neuroleptics now to, to actually try and block uh, the, you know, the D2 receptor and actually treat people with anorexia. I would say that there's a minority of people that have a good response. Most people don't really uh, respond in the way that you want them to, but that also says something about kind of the complexity of biology. But actually, you know, if you target that symptom, actually, you know, which we haven't done very well, uh, you know, that may be actually the key for things like uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, Bilify and Zyprexa for working in, the, in, in these disorders and driving appetite. Uh, um, so I'm going to tell you just a little bit more about one more study that we've done uh, where we've actually asked the question about what happens to people with anorexia when they get hungry. Now, when you get hungry, um, you know, hunger, as I've mentioned before, hunger increases the motivational aspect of stimuli and it activates these regions in the brain that's very important for uh, uh, reward or reduces top-down cognitive inhibitory control. Uh, what does this actually mean when healthy humans are hungry, they're less risk aversive? We've done for a long time. You get animals hungry. They'll use more drugs of abuse. Now it's starting to make sense. And if you go out shopping when you're hungry, your mother probably told you don't do it. It's not a good idea. You'll buy all kinds of stuff that, you know, you don't really need. Um, so, and we use this delayed discounting task, which I mentioned uh, before. The anorexists are, are this group of people that prefer larger rewards later. And we looked here at 23 recovered anorexics versus 17 controls. And what we did is we did the study twice. We fasted people for 16 hours before. They did the study for one condition, and the other one we had them eat normally. And uh, what we did here, just to kind of save time, is I'm only going to show you one, one part of this. And what I'm going to show you here is the response to the ventral striatum and responding to uh, immediate reward. And so if you look at people that respond to immediate reward, the controls, what we see is just what we would expect in the ventral striatum. When people, when controls are fasted, they responded much greater in terms of the ventral striatum than when they were, when they were satiated. Not surprising. What did the anorexics do? Just the opposite. Actually, it's not quite the opposite. Uh, because while we saw a nice difference between fasting and, and, uh, and hunger in the controls, actually, even though this looks reversed, there actually was no significant difference between these states in, in people with anorexia. Um, and so this suggests that there's something abnormal about it, it replicated other findings we have that people with anorexia have a hard time in terms of evaluating reward. And, you know, th there's actually a literature suggesting that uh, people with eating disorders, not only anorexia but bulimia, have difficulties with emotional regulation. And we saw, I'm not showing the data today, we saw exactly the same thing in recovered bulimics and recovered anorexic bulimics. They have this difficulty in evaluating, uh, uh, in activating the ventral striatum when they get hungry. And the other thing that was very interesting about this data is that when you, when you looked at the groups together, we actually saw now a negative relationship with anxiety. Um, and that is the more, the more, uh, 
uh, anxious people are, the less they responded to reward in terms of the ventral striatum. So that's very interesting. Now we're beginning to kind of understand how that anxiety is actually maybe very important in terms of, you know, interacting with this inability to kind of uh, respond to reward. So uh, in terms of people with anorexia, you know, we find that they have difficulty evaluating reward. The more anxious they are, the less they respond to reward in terms of the ventral, uh, ventral striatum. Uh, in terms of the uh, uh, part of the brain that's important for long-term consequences, the more anxious they are, the more oversensitive they seem to be uh, to risk uh, in this part of the brain. Um, and so let me, so, we, you know, this is another way of saying this. Uh, so if food may be generating a risk signal, not reward, and not eating reduces the first of emotion. And no wonder this is a group of people that really are able to starve themselves to death. And I just want to make the, the, you know, the, the, uh, uh, the point here that you know, we think of food as being rewarding. But actually, food, for, particularly for animals, is risky. And that there's, you know, if you're out there looking for food, uh, you're putting yourself at risk and you're liable to get eaten you know, by a fox or something like that. Uh, and if you are, if you're an animal that actually overestimates reward and fails to consider risk, you're actually probably going to get eaten by a fox. You're going to be out of the gene pool. So there's something to be said for being able to overestimate risk. And you know, you can go if you're an animal, you can go without eating a couple of meals in a risky situation, but you're going to stay alive and and pass on these genes. And so I think one of the things that we've failed to really kind of recognize is that people with anorexia may actually have a temperament to be risk avoidant, and that may be wired into our brain as part of, uh, as part of the normal phenomena of kind of uh, uh, responding to, to food and feeding. You know, I, I look at this as kind of an alarm detector. Our ancestors lived in a very dangerous world, and that actually there would be a benefit, particularly thousands of years ago where the world is a riskier place, to actually have a, have a bias to be more sensitive to risk than reward, anticipating danger or error. Uh, having somebody that sits around and worries about what might happen and have some alternative plans if something goes wrong. You know, Mother Nature doesn't really care if you're happy. Mother Nature cares that you stay alive and you pass on your genes. So this may be a very pre self-protective uh, uh, preservation, uh, even though in modern-day society it may not be very pleasant. And, you know, one of the things and points I want to make that's very important, we study a lot of people who recover from anorexia. The traits that get people into trouble with anorexia, they often turn to actually const uh, very constructive kind of benefits after they recover. People with anorexia tend to do really very well in life, particularly in certain professions that reward uh, paying attention to detail, achievement orientation, uh, things like engineering and medicine and research. I tell people all the time, I've never had an eating disorder, but I'm kind of you know, obsessive and perfectionistic. And I can tell you, you're not going to make it as a researcher unless you're kind of obsessive and perfectionistic. Those are certain beneficial kind of traits. The reason that's important is we really need better ways of developing treatments for people with anorexia nervosa. And we're starting to try and use this, this understanding of temperaments now to develop better kind of constructive strategies. So, you know, our, it's really you can't change temperament. Uh, we, we do a lot to kind of do psychoeducational kind of training and sit down with patients and talk about, you know, this phenomena. I can tell you for the patients, it's really pretty meaningless. It doesn't make them feel better. Uh, there's certain structured uh, uh, treatments that work with families in alliance that is called Maudsley or family-based treatment that actually has been shown to be successful in about half of ana uh, adolescent anorexics uh, that actually help to structure the environment of people with anorexia. I think that's very important, but it doesn't reverse the kind of symptoms. We don't really have any way of modifying these behaviors. There aren't any medications that have been proven to work. Um, and uh, or, or work very well. And so, you know, what are we stuck with? Well, we're stuck with trying to understand how people get better, how they use these strategies and temperament in, in more constructive kind of ways, and can we use that in terms of developing better treatments? So we, we're starting to develop what we call uh, temperament-based uh, treatment in uh, eating disorders uh, at, uh, at UCSD, where we're trying to understand what the what we do is we go through a, a structure here. 
we're trying to get people to recognize the symptoms because people often are alexithymic and don't really see them so, understand that they have these kind of behaviors. Uh, we do some psychoeducation, but we, and we do some exercises in how biology can influence behavior and develop more constructive coping strategies, and then see if people can use this in vivo. So let me give you two examples. Um, yeah, so it's been shown in our data supports that people with anorexia you know, have this, are insensitive to reward but oversensitive to punishment. You know, the strategies that we often use for getting people with anorexia to eat and gain weight is to reward them for doing that. Well, it doesn't really work very well. I mean, the relapse rate in anorexia is somewhere between 25, 75 and 50 percent after, you know, after treatment. Um, and so we've been moving away from, we're developing new kind of contracting strategies with, with families, um, and realizing that reward doesn't really kind of motivate and contract them. And I look at people with anorexia as kind of in some ways having like, kind of a, like a learning disability. They can't really code reward in the brain, but they're actually very oversensitive to consequences. So that, the reason is, then the reasoning is, can we start, begin to get people with anorexia to actually respond to consequences or escalating consequences? Um, if uh, and will that be more successful in terms of contracting and getting them to to gain and maintain weight? And we're having some success with that, but clearly this needs to now be you know tested um, and, and to actually make sure that it's true. Uh, other other kinds of uh, characters, kind of traits that we see is uh, sensitive to the uncertainty and change, and anticipatory anxiety. I uh, didn't really talk about that today, but you know we do a lot of treatments in people with anorexia. We, you know, kind of based on, hey, I think this ought to work. You know, without any kind of real data. You know, for example, one of the things that we do with people with anorexia is we expose them to all kinds of foods that they have a lot of difficulty eating that makes them very anxious. And we've all thought that, yeah, that's really a good thing to do. We'll teach them how to eat. Well, you know, there may be something about, uh, you know, all these different kinds of foods that makes them, uh, the change and the uncertainty around it that makes them very anxious. And so we're moving to a strategy now of trying out, you know, let's give people with anorexia basically the same foods every day. That's what they often do when they recover. They eat the same foods every day. You can, you can increase the amount. That may be easier for them to tolerate. Uh, maybe that's not ideal, but, you know, if you're trying to get them to gain and maintain weight, that's not such a bad strategy. So I just want to mention uh, in finishing that we're, uh, uh, we're continuing to do these imaging studies and uh, uh, we'd be del delighted to uh, you know, also talk with you about some collaborative kinds of work uh, like uh, Chuck and I talked about today. And, um, and, but we're still looking for, for people. So if you've recovered from an eating disorder and want a nice a free trip to San Diego and get paid for imaging studies, uh, especially during the middle of winter, so uh, please attend your March. Yes, give us a call. Uh, so that's it. So thanks very much. Thanks.